Please be seated. Would you turn into the inside cover of your bulletin down near the bottom, the seven first words of Easter. I imagine many of you, if you grew up in the church, you, uh, you can't find Danny? He got mad at me and left. Oh, gee. At any rate, uh, if you grew up in the church, you probably heard sermons on the seven last words of Christ, seven last words from the cross. It is finished. I thirst. Well, here are the seven first words of Easter, and they're from this passage that we'll read here in a minute from John's Gospel. Already this morning, on Easter morning, Mary has gone to the tomb to, uh, to be there, hopefully to anoint the body of her Lord. She's wondering, along with Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and Salome, what's, how are we going to get the stone rolled away? They get there, and the stone has been rolled away. They look in, and it's empty. So they're not sure what to do. They run and tell Peter and John, and Peter and John run, and they also see that the tomb is empty. And they leave, not knowing what to do. Like all men, they try to fix it, and they don't know how to fix it. So they leave. Mary stays in the garden. And so the disciples, John and Peter, return to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, probably in the midst of the early morning, the fog. You've seen some of those mornings here. For whatever reason, she didn't rec know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, called her by name. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me. That is to say, the word there, do not hold on to me forever, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house were, where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. May God add his blessing to this reading of God's word. Now, I'm going to follow along these seven first words of Easter. But before I begin that, I want to share with you, there might be some of, most of you here probably believe this wholeheartedly, but there might be some of you who, like me for a number of my years of my life, had trouble believing this. Could I could I base my life on this? Was this really true? Did this, this really happen? And I just want to begin by saying that there's tremendous evidence that is strong, substantial, and compelling that Jesus rose from the dead, indeed, as it says here. That Jesus indeed rose from the dead. Uh, in any court of law, the number of witnesses, I mean, you have a number of witnesses. There's Mary. There's later, and, and Peter and John saw the empty tomb, and later in the day, Jesus appears to not only Mary, but the ten disciples and others gathered with them. So there's all of those witnesses, ten and more. Also earlier that day, on the walk to Emmaus, the road to Emmaus, six miles outside of Jerusalem, and if you ever go to Jerusalem, you might go to Emmaus, Jesus appeared to two disciples, Cleopas and another, that night he appears to all the disciples, and Thomas isn't there. And Thomas says, I'm not going to believe until I touch his 
hands in his side. And Jesus appeared later to him. That's How many is that now? And then he appeared to 500 before he ascended. And later he appeared to Paul. Now that's pretty convincing. But you know not only the external evidence, but you probably know that internally this deep sense in your being that this story is true. In my 45 years of ministry, as I come alongside people at the grave or at the hospice, and I watch people of faith going through this journey and family surrounding them, I, I just know it's true. Um, 23 years ago, we got a call the end of March, and about this time, a month later, I was on the plane to fly up to be with my mom. My mom and family, mom had just uh, learned that she, at age 78, it had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And I remember when I was seven years old, one of my best friends in school at second or third grade, he was swimming in Spain's Creek in this little town I grew up in, and he reached up to pull himself out of the creek, and it was a live wire, and electrocuted him. And my little seven-year-old mind, and I could be 17 or 77, and you'd still ask these same question, why does a good God allow that sort of thing to happen? And I pressed that question to mom, and I didn't think she gave me a very satisfactory answer. She said, we just don't know this side of heaven but God loves us. And I was unsatisfied, and so I spent, that's part of what's made me go to seminary and then study in Germany and then at Princeton and on and on and on and on. And here I was in April, gathered with my mom and six brothers and my dad around mom's chair, and she looked at me and asked me the same question, Danny, why did God let this happen to me? Any of you ever wondered that? Any of you never not wondered that? And I, with tears in my eyes, said the same thing back to mom that she had said to me, Mom, I, I, I don't think we know this side of heaven. I studied the book of Job. I studied the philosophers. Nobody knew more than you knew when I was seven. Except we also know that God loves us and that Jesus rose and this is real. And I said to them, would you like to have Holy Communion? And so... My family there in mom's living, gosh, I can see it as if it was yesterday. And we had bread and a cup, and we remembered the past. That's what you do in communion. We remembered the past when we were growing up, and mom would kiss our bruises and hold us and talk to me as I was moving into adolescence and let me tell her anything that was on my mind. And we remember it together, and then we look to the future because that's another dimension of Holy Communion. It's a feast that prepares us for the heavenly feast, and we would all be reunited one day, and that's our hope, that's our strength, that's what Easter is about, one of the things it's about. And then we lived in the present, and we knew and affirmed that the risen Christ was present with us. So I just want to say to anybody doubting today, I've been there. But I know in the depths of my being, this is true. This is true. There's also that evidence of these despondent, despairing, discouraged disciples suddenly transforming the world, breathing new life <laughs> into a tired, despondent, self-centered, greedy, fatalistic world. Um, back in 1986, 84, we moved from New Jersey to Florida. Moved to Fort Lauderdale. We were there two years, and then we went to Titusville, and somebody, one of my friends, said, you ought to go to Leesburg every year, the Institute of Preaching. And they have lectures there about how to preach. And they are called, I got there, and they're called the Hamilton Lectures on Preaching. I'd never heard of J. Wallace Hamilton. But I met his widow, Florence, and we began to talk, and the next year I met her again, and I'd never heard of Pasadena, except I thought it was the little old lady from Pasadena. 
I met a bunch of them since I've been here. At any rate. <laughs> and Florence Hamilton pulled me aside and she had a stack of eight and a half by 11 typed sermons of J. Wallace Hamilton. I don't know whether she saw promise or pity, but she handed them to me. And I remember years ago, I couldn't find them. There must be up in Gainesville. But I remember the description J. Wallace Hamilton used about this new group of disciples breathing life and energy and spirit and power into a fatalistic, discouraged world. Never forget it. I never forget it. Look at me, look with me at these seven first words of Easter. A question asked, why are you crying? On Easter, as you look at those lists of names in memory of, it's mainly joy we have here today. But there's also some tears and remembrance because if our lost loved ones or ones that we know, and I miss mom and dad, and you've got loved ones who are no longer here. Why are you crying? Because our faith doesn't deny the reality of loss and the death of the great the enemy. Death is the greatest enemy, and Jesus conquered death, but it's a formidable enemy, and it's strong but he overcomes it. But the question is real, why are you crying? And then the second question is, who is it you're looking for? And I've learned something in these last 10 years. Have you noticed it? There are fewer and fewer people who know who Jesus is or what Easter's about. I remember a couple years ago watching Jimmy Kimmel, he sent, or one of those guys, sent uh, people out on the street and said, put a microphone. What's Easter about? No clue. You've got a tough assignment, folks, because later he says, and so send I you. And there's less than this, and the fastest growing religious group is the one called nuns. They don't want anything to do with the church because who is it you're looking for? And, and, and the one that everybody's looking for is covered over, layered over by political commentary and battling and church conferences and votes and this and that and distortions. There's mistaken identity of who Jesus really is. If you saw who Jesus really is, you wouldn't reject him. <laughs> You'd want to fall in love with him because the common people followed him and loved him. And, and this church is all about, somebody came up after the last service and said, you know, I grew up in a different tradition. I just love this church. I'm here two months and it's so uplifting. And I think he's saying the Jesus you present is the Jesus Everybody wants to know. The question's a good one, isn't it? Who is it you're looking for? And then a name called. Do you remember when he called your name? Do you remember when he called your name and embraced you? Mary. And you knew that you knew that you knew. And then he says, don't hold on to me forever. It's not that he didn't want her to touch him. It's just, don't, you can't hold on to me forever. And you, you, you know, you find something good, you want to hold on to it forever, you can't do it. You got to let it go. God's always going to do a new thing. You're going to love your new senior pastor. Be here next Sunday and you hear about it. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm returning to my father. He's claiming his kingdom. And then he says, I'm sending you. You know he's sending you, right? You can't just come here, take your flower and go home. You've got to come here and tell the world. Yes, you do. Amen? Amen. 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 And a gift offered. Receive the Holy Spirit. In my best days, in my best days, I know the risen Christ is with me, and when I'm fearful, I hear him whisper, fear not. And when I'm around the grandkids, and we've been together for a week, and I can hardly move, I'm so worn out. <laughs> I think of you moms and dads, or your children just kind of wear you out. I hear him say, 
Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And when I'm feeling alone, he said, Lo, I'm with you always. And when I don't know if I can do something, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when I feel tempted and tried and failed, he says, greater is he who is within you than he is in the world. It's all true. Receive the Holy Spirit. I couldn't find the right story to close with. But I remembered, since I've become friends with the archivist here, Barbara, Barbara Dye, uh, she, you know, hands me things every now and then. And, 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 you know, a while back, she handed me a stack about this thick. These, these are J. Wallace Hamilton's, all his ser- a lot of his sermons. Those of you who knew, he used to be here a long time ago. And she handed me these stack, and they're in the great form. And she, she said to me, um, here, Dan, um, I, 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 I think your preaching could benefit from these. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Barbara. Wave, yeah. <laughs> she didn't say that. She just thought that. Uh, <laughs> but I'm really grateful, and I've left a set of these for the next preacher, just so you know. But he closed this sermon ri- this is 1967, he closed this sermon entitled, Why We Believe in Everlasting Life. And he closed it with a story that he shares that he learned it from Harry Emerson Fosdick, great preacher of Riverside, New York, right down the street from where Esther went to seminary. He says this, In English post offices, they have a clerk named the Nixie clerk, whose function it is to handle all the letters with inadequate addresses. One such clerk on Christmas Eve was at his desk, a heartbroken man because death had just taken his little boy. One of the first letters he picked up was addressed, Santa Claus, the North Pole. And attached to it was a note from the postman who'd picked it up. And the note said, this was given to me by a little girl at 302 Walnut Street. Barbara, do you remember this story? Oh, good. Okay. The clerk was startled, for that was his own home. He looked at it, and sure enough, the letter was addressed in his own small daughter's handwriting. And when he opened it, this is what he read. Dear Santa Claus, we're very sad at our house this year and I don't want you to bring me anything. My little brother went to heaven last week and all I want you to do when you come home to my house is take his toys to him. I'll leave them in the corner by the chimney, his hobby horse and train and everything. You see, he'll be lost up there without them, especially his horse. So you must take them to him, and you needn't mind leaving me anything. But if you could give Daddy something that would make him stop crying, I wish you would. I heard him say to Mommy that only eternity could cure him. Could you send him some of that? And I'll be your good little girl, Miriam. Who among us doesn't need some eternity this morning? Peace of the living Christ. Dwell among you and within you. Pray with me, would you? Almighty and loving God, this is the day of days. Christ the Lord is risen today. Ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.